in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. We appreciate your presence here in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we kind of an inspiration to you. And so if you'll pray for us, if you're born again believer, we appreciate that very much. In the absence of Paul this morning, Brother Gibson will be directing our uh, singing. Paul will be back for the service tonight. And so the first song will be one entitled Living by Faith, page 162. Get that number ready and Brother Gibson will take over and lead us in that number at this time. Just before the message today, Brother Denver Campbell and, and Brother Howard Gibson is going to sing a beautiful number entitled Near the Cross. Brother Campbell is one of our deacons here. We thank God for him, also one of our Sunday school teachers. And he and Brother Gibson will sing this number for us at this time.
Thank you, Brother Gibson, Brother Campbell, and Debbie for that beautiful number. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn, will you please, to 2 Kings chapter 10 today for the reading of God's Word. 2 Kings chapter 10 is page 330, uh, 434, 434 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I want to say to you out in the radio listen audience, if you'd like to have the little uh, widow's mite, you must write for it right away because today will be the last time I make mention of it. I brought something back from the Holy Land with me. It's a little widow's mite. Jesus commended the widow for giving the little mite all that she had. And so if you've never seen one, if you'd write in request it, I'd be glad to send you one of the little widow's mite. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Turn when you please to uh, the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 10. A lot of strange things happening this day and time. Someone was telling about this drunk that walked up to a parking meter and put a dime in the parking meter and the indicator jumped up on 60. He kindly shook his head and said, my, my, I said, I've lost 100 pounds since I weighed the last time. So many times you find people doing crazy things. We're living in a crazy world, as you know. And it's getting worse all the time. And I hope you're turning to 2 Kings chapter 10. While you're doing that, let me say just a word to you that's concerned about all the terrible crime that's been committed and by some of the unjust deeds being done by a lot of crooked judges and lawyers. Now don't misunderstand me. We have some good, clean, honest, upright judges. We have some honest lawyers as far as I know. And you have some judges and some lawyers are crooked that have to screw their britches on when they get up every morning. For instance, in the state of Georgia last week, there was a lawyer that overturned a conviction by a jury that convicted a cold-blooded murder and kidnapper. This murder and kidnapper kidnapped two honest people, innocent people, carried them out in the woods and killed them. And they were tried before a jury and they sentenced the person that committed the murder to two death sentences and a 99 year sentence for kidnapping. That was two years ago. This past week, this no doubt liberal, crooked uh, judge, no doubt being bribed, overturned that conviction. I guess maybe he figured he knew more than the 12 people on the jury. And it's such people as that that needs to be removed from their position. The land's being filled with uh, judges, federal judges, state judges and whatnot, being appointed to them by politicians and so forth. And they are bribed many times. They sell out. They are pro-criminal. They love the criminal because that's where they make their money and people committing crime. And, and judges like that have no business sitting on the judge's bench. And something ought to be done about it. And I want to pass this on to you. Right now, there's an organization in Washington known as the Washington Legal Foundation. It's an organization that's now formed and they're uh, gaining momentum. And this organization, the purpose for it is to check out these crooked judges that do these crooked things, that love the criminals with no sympathy toward the victim of their families, to check them out on some of these deeds that they're performing. And the organization is located in Washington, D.C. It's known as the Washington Legal Foundation. The address is 1612K, K Street, Northwest, Suite 502, Washington, D.C., 20006. And I thank God for this organization. It's greatly needed because some of these crooked judges today need to be straightened out and kicked off the beach because of what they're doing, which is wrong and which is sinning and betraying the innocent people just as much as Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus Christ. And people are getting sick and tired of it. Jury convicts a man and then the judge overturns the conviction through bribery or because of his organization or someone putting pressure on him or because he loves the criminal. And the honest and upright people in this country is getting sick and tired of that kind of stuff. And I'm for this organization. 
and you should be, and maybe they can straighten out some of these uh, people that's doing this type kind of business in the land today. Now, that's not my message. You may say, preach, I just don't much like what you said. Well, I don't care whether you like it or not. It's not my business to tell you what you like. It's my business to tell you what you ought to know and what this Bible has to say. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 15, the Bible said, When he was departed thence, he lied on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right? as my heart is with thy heart. And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it is be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Now Jehu is the man that made this statement in verse 16. He said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Now today I want to speak to you about having zeal for the Lord. Now you heard people make the statement, they say, well, the man has more zeal than knowledge. Well, that may be true, but we need both zeal and knowledge. And here we find a man by the name of Jehu that had great zeal for God. Now he's a man that whenever they saw him coming down the highway in his chariot, He'd be driving so fast until they knew that was Jehu. When a man would go by, they'd see the dust, see him coming, and look, and behold, they see him going, and all the thing left was dust. They said, I know who that was. That was Jehu. He's the only man that drives like that. And so he had great zeal for God. Now, the word zeal means eager. It means interest. It means enthusiasm. It means ardent. It means endeavor. It means devotion or of fervor. And this man had all of these characteristics. He had a great zeal for God. Now he was king of Israel and he went out to straighten out some of the mess in Israel in that day. And get rid of some of the... This man did not have an automobile, but he had a chariot and some fast horses. And he drove furiously. He stayed on the move. Uh, beloved, that was his nature. He wasn't the kind of a fellow to sit still or sit around and wait for someone else to do the job. He had a job to do and he had great zeal in getting it done. And he knew that the prophet said that old lady Jezebel would be slain and he was eager to see that done. And he knew that God Almighty said that these Balaamites should be killed and the sons of old Ahab and old lady Jezebel should be destroyed. And he set out to do that job. Now we find that he had this responsibility to see that old lady Jezebel was put to death and he wanted to get that done as quick as possible. You find a lot of people in the Bible that had zeal. Paul said Israel had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge in Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. They had a great zeal, but they were heading in the wrong direction. Now you need to have the right kind of zeal. You need to have zeal rather than the right kind of direction. Paul had great zeal for his religion before he was saved, but he was wrong. He'll tell you in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6, he had great zeal for his religion, but he was headed down the wrong road. Jesus was full of zeal in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7, and prophecy pertaining to the Lord Jesus said he had great zeal. And you have many people in the Bible that had great zeal for God. And one of the crying needs of the church today is we have more zeal for the Lord. We need knowledge, all right, but sitting around with knowledge and no zeal, you're not going to get anything done for God. Now, first of all, we need zeal for the Bible. In Psalms 119 and verse 139, it says, My zeal hath consumed me because my enemies have forgotten thy word. Now the psalmist was disturbed here because people had forgotten the word of God and failed to be enlightened in God's word. Every born again Christian ought to have a zeal for God. Jehu said to Jezebel in 2 Kings chapter 9 verses 30 through 33, he said, this is the word of the Lord. In other words, Jezebel, God has sent me here to take care of you. You're going to be put to death. you got to die. Because she's a very wicked, wicked woman and incurs Israel's sin by worshiping Balaam. And he said, a stop must be put to it. You must die. 
He also had a zeal for God's word when he marched out. Seventy of Ahab's sons chopped their heads off, put about 35 in one basket and 35 in another. He had a zeal for God. He knew that they must be destroyed. God said they must be destroyed. And he had a zeal to get it done and he chopped their heads off. Seventy of Ahab's sons. Now we should study the word of God and make it known. We know the Bible is God's word in spite of God, given of God. And we must study the word of God and make it known and believe this book. I was greatly disturbed here a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago, when the governor of this state, there repealed a law in the books that had been there 101 years. And that law was according to the Bible, where it said the man was the head of his wife and the head of his home. That was placed on the books 101 years ago by our forefathers that believed the Bible and knew God and feared God. And this woman brought up a resolution and worked at it many years. And, and of course she didn't believe the Bible according to the article in the paper. She didn't believe what God said. And, and she puts pressure on the governor and he repeals that law. The governor of Georgia I'm talking about. Brother that done him up for me. I voted for the man. I encouraged our people to do likewise. But when he sat on in the seat thinking he knew more than God and allowed this woman to high pressure him in repealing a law according to the Bible, that fixed him. He don't get my vote anymore. You're welcome whether you like it or not. Not only that, but a few other things I've been disappointed in through compromise and so forth. But anyway, that's beside the point. I want to show you from the Word of God that we should have a zeal for this book. If God said it in this Bible, then we must believe what God put in this book. Now this uh, woman that, that uh, they heisted up this uh, resolution, instigated and, and talked the governor in signing the thing, she didn't believe the Bible. According to the article, she didn't believe the Bible. This book is true, and the Bible says, let God be true and every man a lie. You better believe this book. Amen. You have a lot of infidels in the land today, and atheists and ungodly people, and and uh, these modern infidels that don't believe this book, but you better stick by this book. Because one day you'll answer God for it. Be zealous for the Bible. Be zealous that you live according to the Bible. Then we'll move on to another thought. And that is we need to be, ze uh, be zealous for the house of God. Now we know that the prophets, the men of God, believe the Bible and honor the Bible. And the Bible has a lot to say about the house of God. And we need to be zealous for the house of God. The house of God should be a very sacred place and a holy place. When you come into this building, this ought to be a holy place. A sacred place. You shouldn't be throwing chewing gum paper on the floor, which I hope you don't do. You shouldn't be putting chewing gum all over the back of the pews, which I hope you don't do. Those things on the back of your pew are made for books and not for paper and trash. I hope you're intelligent enough to know that. That's not a trash rack, that's a book rack. And you need to honor the house of God and respect the house of God and be glad when you go into the house of God. In John chapter 2 and verse 17, his disciples remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The old psalmist said in Psalms chapter 84, verses 1 and 10, I am the call of thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. David said, I'd rather just be the, the, the janitor, just a doorkeeper in God's house than to live in the tents of wicked people. He loved the house of God. And you ought to love God's house and try to get to God's house every time you possibly can. One of the greatest men I've ever known, Brother Curtis Potts, his wife told me some time ago, I believe it's in her Bible or his Bible, he has written in this Bible of his or hers, whichever the case is, the North Side Baptist Church is my church. Now, brother, he didn't have to write that down. He proved that by his very action, and he loved this church. This was his church. He said, it's my church. And when we had a service here, he, he was here. The only thing that would keep him away, he'd have to be fastened in the hospital. And if they let him out in the morning, he'd be here that night. I've known that to happen. He'd come and bring cushions to sit on and come to the house of God. 
Curtis Potts, where are you today? We need you, brother. I'll tell you, I would to God we had a dozen like him. I've never seen a man in my life any more zealous for the house of God. He loved it. He couldn't hardly wait to get here. Whenever he passed away, just a few hours before he died, he was on the way to church and he got so sick until he couldn't drive. He said to his wife, you'll have to drive. She said, what do you want me to do? You want me to take you home, back home? You want me to take you to the hospital? You want me to take you to Northside Baptist Church? He said, take me to my church. When he walked in that door back there, it was white as a sheet, and I knew the man couldn't stand up long, and we got someone to rush into the hospital. A few hours, he was in heaven. But he wanted to come to the house of God. He was as a type of man that, through a little headache, a little sickness, used that as an excuse to stay out of church a Sunday after Sunday. He was a man you couldn't keep him away. He had a zeal for the house of God. You had to hold him back. I've known him be in the house of God when his brother's lying corpse. I've known him be in the house of God when some of his relatives was real sick. The average church member would use that for excuse to jump on that and say, Well, my cousin's sick or dead or my uncle or my aunt. Or, and so I'm going to have to be excused out of the service and be sure I go see them. And instead of using their own time, they use God's time for that. Curtis Potts wouldn't do that, brother. Where are you, Curtis? We need you today, brother. I know you're in heaven and... You love God and serve God better off than we are. We need some men that are zealous for the house of God. Too many church members, half-hearted, many of them unsaved, look up for every little excuse they can find to stay away from God's house when they know good and well they could be in the church. They know they could be in the church. They know their little excuse doesn't hold water. They know that. And God knows that. We need people that are zealous for the house of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, For two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13, it said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. When those people began to make merchandise of the house of God, Jesus walked in there and made him a whip, and he drove the, the cattle out of the building, and he kicked over the money changers' tables, he took, took the doves and told them to take them out, and he said, this house is a house of prayer and not a place of merchandise. The house of God ought to be a sacred place for God's people, a holy place. And when you come in, you ought to thank God. I have a church where I can come and worship God because God is there. Amen. The Bible said, where two or three are met in my name, Jesus said, I'm there. Yes, you can worship God at home to a certain extent. You can worship God on the highway to a certain extent. But if you go to the house of God, Jesus said, I'll be there. Would you like to be where Jesus is? He said, where well, two or three are gathered in my name, I'm right there. And when you come into the house of God, you're coming into a building where the Son of God is. He's here in person of the Holy Spirit. And you need a zeal for the house of God. Instead of trying to look for and trying to scrape up or organize some kind of pet excuse to stay away from church, you ought to be making every effort you can to be sure that you're in the house of God at the post of duty. You'd be glad you did when you come to the end of life's journey. We need a, a zeal for the house of God. Then number three, we need a zeal in Christian giving. Every born-again believer ought to give one-tenth of every dime he earns in the work of God and then sacrifice as much as he can otherwise to give more. You need to have a zeal for giving. God keeps the record. And God knows what you do and what you're able to do. And if you're a born-again believer and you're a God robber, don't be surprised if God one of these days don't cut your salary down according to your giving. Don't be surprised if one of these days you become disabled to earn a living and a lot of that money you've hoarded up and robbed God and kept in your treasures. You may have to pay out to be able to get a little ease in your body before you die. It's a dangerous thing for a born-again believer to be a God robber. Every child of God that has an income, whether you be a junior or an immediate or adult or elderly person or whatnot, if you have an income at least one dime, out of every dollar that comes to you is God's. If you don't give it to God, you're robbing God. You're keeping that that belongs to God. And one of these days, God's going to settle up with you about that matter. You say, I've, I've been uh, robbing God a long time. Seem to get along all right. Are you saved? You might not be saved. 
But if you're saved, there's a day when God say, hey, let's have a settlement about this matter of what you've been doing about your money. I want to settle up with you on this matter. And God said, I'm going to take mine plus interest. And it's going to take you a long time to pay her up. Beloved, it's dangerous you need to have a zeal of forgiving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, for it's touching the ministry of the saints, it's a purpose for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to these of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal have provoked very many. Paul is saying here to this church, because of your zeal in Christian giving, you have challenged other churches to do likewise. When people hear about your Christian giving, that entices them to do so. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, the Bible said, If you sow sparingly, you go to reap sparingly. God blesses the church that gives and gives again and gives and gives again and gives until it hurts and then give a little more. I never apologize for trying to get God's people left treasures in heaven. I'm doing you a favor. We had a jaybird sitting here several years ago, sitting here listening to me preach 10 to 15 years. As far as I know, he never gave anything. One Sunday left, he said, I'm not going back to that church. And his wife said, why? I said, preacher always talks too much about money. You know why he said that? He's a God robber. All he's done since he left, he wandered around one place to another. And usually, the people that gripe and groan about giving are the ones that don't tithe and don't give. Those that give like they should never open their mouth. They know what they should do. And they consider it a privilege. Young people have a job, you need to tithe your income. Every person, regardless of how your income may be, whether it be through Social Security or whatnot, or job, or how it may come, you need to tithe that income into God's Word. And then number four, you need a zeal for people. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 13, I bear him record that he had the great zeal for you, and then the lesson of Laodicea. Now, we need to have a zeal for people. People are important. People are created by God. They did not evolve from a monkey. They created, they're created by God. People, Jesus died for. We need to have a zeal for people. Paul mentioned a man's name in Colossians 4, 12, and said he prayed for the people. Now, we need to try to win the people, do all we can, to reach people. People are important. They're valuable. They got a soul. They go into hell if they're not reached for God. There's a gorilla one time. He gave birth to a little baby gorilla. And that mother loved that little baby so until she hugged it in her bosom. You could hardly see his little face sticking out. And she wouldn't turn it loose for anything. She loved it so she wouldn't even let it nurse. She wouldn't turn it loose for, for nursing. She just held it in her bosom. All you could see was a little face. You know they had to tranquilize that uh, gorilla to get her to turn that baby loose so they could let it nurse. She loved that baby so she would not even turn it loose so the little thing could feed. And you can see how that gorilla loved that little baby of hers. And I believe we need to love people, love your family, love your children, and love your mother-in-law. And love you, you preaching. Now those would be too hard ones, I guess, for you to love, but you ought to do it anyway by the grace of God. Love your, love, uh, your neighbors. Love your friends. God says to, for God's people to love each other. And you need to do that. And you, then number five, you need to be zealous for God's servants. Many people take God's servants too lightly. And I, I'm not saying this because I'm a preacher. I'm saying this because the word of God needs to be preached. It ought to be said, well, I preach it or not. Most people take God's servants uh, too lightly. They say, well, uh, the old preacher, he's, uh, I guess he's doing all right. As far as I know, I hadn't known maybe in years how he's doing, but I guess he's doing all right. Now, at the church at Philippi, the Bible says, Philippians 4.10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your cure of me has first again, wherein you also care for, but you lacked opportunity. Paul is bragging on the church at Philippi because they took care of his needs. He said, you took care of me, and I appreciate it. Then he wrote to the church in Galatians, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5, I bear you record that if any had been possible, you had plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul had uh, probably some eye disease. He said, you love me enough and consider me enough as your pastor or as the preacher, you'd pluck out your own eyes and give them to me if you could. 
Then he wrote to the church at Rome and commended them. He wrote to the, another church at two and commended them for what they had done for him. And he appreciated it very much. He was God's man. Here a few years ago, someone called me from a church out in the country, over in Madison County. And as some of the leaders of that church, they said, Preacher Edwards, our pastor has been here with us 20 years. And we appreciate him and we love him. And we want to do something for him. We want to send him and his wife to the Holy Land and show our appreciation for having been with us some 20 years. That was, that was wonderful. They had some thoughtful people in that church like that. And they sent the man of God. He was a great blessing and he was a blessing to me and many others. That was a group of people one time that pastored me with them 37 years. 37 years and he was leaving them. And some of the men got together and they said, well, our pastor's leaving now. I think we ought to do a little something for him. He's been, you know, 37 years. They said, what do you think we ought to do? They said, well, I think we ought to give him a camera. He might want to take a few pictures along after he leaves us and I think it'd be nice if he'd give him a camera. That was a man of God standing nearby and he overheard what they said. He walked up to that bunch of deacons and those church members. He said, now we hear you say you, your pastor's been with you 37 years and you want to give him a camera and appreciation. My man, he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Been here 37 years and want to give him a camera for a departing gift. Said, why, well, you ought to absolutely be ashamed to even think about a little something like that. They said, well, we hadn't thought much about it. Said, uh, what do you suggest we give him, preacher? He said, give him a brand new automobile. Exactly like he wants with all the extras. He said, they got to talking about that thing. Felt so ashamed about what they thought about doing. That crowd got together and gave that preacher a brand new automobile. A few days later, he and his wife left him and told him goodbye in the new automobile, the kind he wanted and kind he liked to go on and finish his ministry for the Lord. God has blessed that people for doing that. I've known pastors that stay at churches 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and churches have done things like that. I know other churches where they completely ignore him. They wouldn't give him a stamped envelope for having been there 25 years. But let me listen to me. God knows these things and God realizes and sees these things and you should have a zeal for the man of God. I'm standing here before you today. I'm, I'm having a birthday coming up next uh, Saturday, Lord willing. I've, I've been 39 and holding for I don't know how long. And so next Saturday, if God spares me to see next Saturday, I'll be two score, two decade, two years, 12 months, and 52 weeks old. I've been pastor this church here for more than a quarter of a century. I'm not asking you to do anything for me. That's beside the point. That's up to you. I wouldn't want a thing out of you if it didn't come from your heart. If I were to leave today, I wouldn't want you to buy me enough gas to get out of Clark County unless you wanted to do it. These things must come from the heart because people love God and want to do it. Now these preachers in these convention churches, they have retirement fund. And for pastor to go along and squat and bow and kneel to the that is the convention and do what the convention wants them done, wants them to do, then they will give him a little uh, monthly income after he leaves. But he better walk the chalk line if he's going to get it. The independent Baptists don't have that. They don't have an annuity program. When the pastor leaves from independent Baptist church, unless the church decides to make him pastor emeritus and give him a little salary or pay his utility bill, do a little something for him after he leaves, all he's got to live on is his little social security. He may spend 40 years serving those people. They say, goodbye, preacher. I hope you don't starve death on your Social Security. Is that the way to treat a man of God after he's given his life and burned out and married you and buried you dead and prayed with you while you're sick and stood by you? No, sir. Any church that's got any type of leadership on the deacon board or in the church knows what they should do in a time when it arrives like that. If they don't do it, there's something wrong somewhere or another. And a lot of churches have let, neglected the men of God in that respect. A lot of them have been gone. I saw a man the other day. He drove a brand new automobile. And he said he'd been in the church 25 years. The church gave it to him in appreciation. Man, the other day, I, I get his bulletin. He had a brand new Fleetwood Cadillac on his bulletin. He said his church gave it to him in appreciation for the period of time he's been there. I know some churches are not able to do that. Some are not able, not financially able. I know that. 
And the church is not able, they're not able. But you'd be surprised what people can do if they want to do it. Too many of God's men have been neglected in that respect. A few years ago, a dear preacher friend of mine in Greenville, South Carolina, had been serving the Westview Baptist Church for a great number of years. I saw him, his heart was heavy, his head was bowed. I said to him, Doc, I said, what you so down about? It's right after Christmas. He said, uh, he said, son, did you know that I didn't even as much as get a Christmas card from one of my members, let alone a Christmas gift? They completely ignored me and my wife at Christmas time. Didn't even get a Christmas card. I felt sorry for the poor fellow. I knew his heart was bleeding. Sometimes you have churches where you've got no leadership and nobody that can think or do anything or look forward to see about the need of the preacher, know what he needs and how he's getting along, how he's faring. Sometimes you have church don't have leadership enough to do anything about it. But other churches, you do have leaders in your church that can think, they know, they're concerned, and they want to see that the preacher is taken care of. Churches like that all over the land. And you need to have a zeal for the man of God. Then you need to have a zeal for rights. You need to have a zeal for uh, spiritual gifts. And then finally, finally, I'm going to use a very bad word here. If you'll forgive me for using this bad word. Don't cut your radio off out there. Let me use this bad word. The bad word I'm going to use is work. A zeal for work. Now God's people need to be concerned about working. Working for a living, working for God. It's amusing when you drive down the highway and you see six men working beside the highway. You got five standing there watching one man work. And he's not breaking his back. And you see it everywhere. I've, I've been around where people in groups are working. I guarantee you, you're going to find more men standing there looking on while one or two is doing a little digging or sawing or cutting or whatever needs to be done. People are afraid of work. And if you talk about reducing their salary, they, oh, now we're going to strike. We're going to get the union on you. And, this, and they're afraid to bend their back and do a little work. The Bible said if a man won't work, he should be. If he's too lazy to work, let him starve to death. A lot of these people on welfare today, they're too lazy to work, not going to work as long as you keep them on welfare and take care of their bills and give them free hospitalization, things like they're not going to work. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go to work sampling pies in a pie factory. Too lazy to work. I was doctor's office the other day, great big old stout woman sitting there. She had the most grunts and groans any person I ever heard, groaning and grunting about this, groaning and grunting. I, and then pulled out a cigarette about half as long as, looked like as long as my fingers to my elbow, the way it looked. Lit the thing up, started fogging out the room. I said, uh, did you know that thing that you're sucking on there is, is damaging your health and causing your problem more than any other one thing? Yeah, I, thought, I believe, I know that, she said. She said that uh, she only smokes about four a day. Didn't take her a few minutes, she, she kind of put that one out. But anyway, beloved, listen to me. You have some people there that's not going to work. And you mentioned the word work to them, that's a dirty word. They want the government to keep them up. They want you, the taxpayers to keep them up, not going to work. In Acts chapter 9, verse 36, there's a woman in the name of Dorcas. Let me read this, and I'll come to a close. Now there was a job, a certain disciple named Tabetha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and all these which she did. Here's a woman that worked. She did what she could. God put her name in the Bible and commended her. Don't be afraid of work. God means for us to work. Dwight L. Moody was on a ship one time, crossing the pond from England to America, a thing caught on fire. And they got their water buckets, and they started putting out the five of those buckets. And Moody, he was handing a bucket of water down to another, handing buckets of water on down. Somebody came and said, Mr. Moody said, don't you think we ought to go down here in the prayer room and, and pray about this fire? He said, man, I'm praying right now. Not only am I praying, I'm doing something about it. He was praying while he was passing the water buckets on. Everybody in the Bible that you find that God called and used, they were busy when God called them. God is not going to bless a lazy person. God's going to bless and use those that are busy and looking for something to do when he calls them. You need to be zealous for work. Many things we could mention, but time is up for now. I appreciate you listening. You've listened well. I want everybody to stand to your feet. Dear Father, today I pray in the name of Jesus that you use the message 
Not only in this building, but God, I pray that you'll use the message out of the vast radio listening audience. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. And all we say or do because I pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Now, Brother Gibson is going to lead us in a couple of stanzas. And if there's anybody in the building needs to come forward, then you come. If you want to join the church, get saved, come back to God or whatever, let's sing a maybe stanza. So what number? 81. Number 81. Let's sing a stanza. So give you a chance to respond if God is speaking to your heart. Just as I am. going. 